So I would like to uh, finish the, uh, the part from yesterday about applications of graph neural networks and then talk about applications in uh, 3D computer vision and graphics. So you're probably now experts in whatever regards uh, Laplacian operators after Justin's talk. So uh, uh, I will uh, probably it will allow me to skip some of the things that, uh, uh, that you, you have already seen. I, I might repeat a few things, but uh, much faster. So uh, just uh, for reference, these are the slides uh, from yesterday. If you haven't seen them, uh, you can look at them. And also we have website geometricdeeplearning.com uh, where you can find uh, other material, including video recordings of lectures. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about applications. Uh, I will run through it briefly because uh, then uh, we can talk a little bit more about uh, applications in graphics and vision. Uh, so basically, I remind you what we uh, discussed yesterday was how to do deep learning on graphs. Basically, we've seen uh, roughly two kinds of problems where we wanted to classify the nodes of the graph, basically by propagating information uh, in the graph, usually you would know the labels of a few nodes, and then uh, you would like to infer the uh, unknown uh, or unlabeled uh, uh, nodes. You have some features uh, on the nodes or the edges or both, and uh, uh, usually it is done in a semi-supervised transductive setting, uh, where you basically where you use the structure of the graph to to find the, the uh, unknown labels. So here is one example of application in uh, medical diagnosis. Basically, you can think of uh, some population of uh, patients you model them as uh, some kind of uh, some uh, basically some kind of feature space so you can uh, 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 you can construct a graph in this uh, in this space so basically similar patients uh, will be uh, will, will be connected by an agent in this graph and then you can propagate information on this graph to uh, to uh, decide for example if one patient is uh, is sick or not so it has been applied for, uh, for automatic diagnosis. It's a good question, actually, how to build this graph. Usually it is uh, constructed axiomatically, uh, uh, but uh, you could actually learn it together with the filters on this graph. Uh, another application also from the biomedical domain is uh, in brain imaging. So here you actually model uh, the brain as a graph. And uh, in this case, uh, this is a work from Imperial College where you uh, uh, basically you get uh, functional MRI data. Uh, that represents uh, certain activations, basically how uh, uh, the brain reacts to different stimuli. And uh, you, for example, you can also classify different uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So this is uh, just maybe a silly example of an application. You can uh, very, very accurately classify the, the sex of the person based on this uh, functional MRI response. So apparently the, the brains of uh, males and females are wired differently. Uh, another application in cancer research, so you can uh, look at gene expressions. Basically, it will be a long vector about uh, roughly 20,000 dimensions. But genes basically are related to each other, so you can uh, encode it as a graph as well. So it's a, a, a gene interaction graph. And uh, basically, using this uh, graph uh, adds a lot of uh, prior information about the problem, so you can get uh, much better results than just considering it as a vector. Uh, another interesting uh, domain where uh, geometric deep learning can be applied is uh, uh, drug and material design. So if you think of uh, basically maybe very abstractly and very naively of this problem, uh, you have a combinatorially large space of uh, molecules, right? So if you think, I think uh, estimates are around 10 to the, to the power 80 of uh, synthesizable medium-sized molecules. So obviously you cannot test every molecule uh, in the lab. Right? So you want some kind of computational funnel that allows you to discard uh, most of the uh, candidates that are not suitable. You don't even want to test them experimentally. And you use computational techniques. So at the lowest level, obviously, you can do an experiment. Uh, then above it, you can do uh, quantum mechanical simulations. DFT, density functional theory, is used as a kind of lightweight version of uh, quantum mechanical simulations. So, uh, with graph neural networks, you can reach the accuracy of DFT being about five orders of magnitude faster. That was a work from DeepMind two years ago where they showed these results. Uh, and uh, even, even more interestingly, you can try to do synthesis, so you can try to generate graphs, molecular graphs, with some prescribed properties. So this is a very hot topic. Uh, it is slightly more complicated than just generating graphs in general. 
uh, uh, generative models for graphs is a difficult problem because you don't have uh, uh, natural correspondence between graphs. So usually if in kind of autoencoder architecture, you would input, uh, let's say, an image and output an image, you can compare how good your reconstruction is. Right? You will just, for example, subtract the two images from each other and take a norm. With graphs, you need to establish a correspondence. So that's, uh, that's why the problem is much more complicated. But there are some works that try to do it. So this is an example of molecular graphs that are generated by uh, a graph uh, VAE. And another application in, uh, in the domain of uh, medicine and drug design is actually drug repositioning. So you take existing drugs, you, you can apply them to different diseases. And in this case, you also employ uh, the, the, the gene or, or interaction or the protein to protein interaction networks. Basically drugs, as you know, they're usually designed to bind to some proteins to dis disrupt certain metabolic uh, uh, pathways. And basically this is modeled here by, uh, by this graph of drug to protein interaction. The protein to protein interaction roughly describes how our body functions. And you're trying to predict edges in the drug to drug uh, uh, graph that models uh, side effects. So if you uh, administer two drugs together, they might uh, uh, not work as you expect. There might be some surprising, sometimes harmful and dangerous side effects. So this is a cool work from uh, the group of Uri Leskowitz from Stanford. Uh, we also did an uh, interesting work about discovering uh, drug-like molecules in food. We call it hyperfoods, basically uh, pan on uh, superfoods that you often hear about different magic diets that uh, supposedly will do uh, some miracles with you. Uh, so we actually uh, look at it as a classification problem. We try to find drug-like properties uh, in molecules and also from the way that these molecules interact with uh, proteins in our body. So uh, uh, it, it's a paper that was published recently in Nature Scientific Reports. And uh, obviously food is a very interesting topic, so we even got into, uh, into uh, yellow press uh, together with gossip about the royal family and, and, and some other stuff. I, I don't understand why it's not working properly. Yeah, so uh, another um, application is in, uh, uh, in particle physics. So obviously you can model interactions of uh, uh, particles as, as graphs, right? So you, you can think of uh, uh, jets of particles that are created when two particles collide. So graph neural networks have been applied uh, to analyze data from, uh, from the LHC, Large Hadron Collider. Uh, we uh, had a collaboration with, uh, with uh, the Ice Cube Observatory, the Neutrino Observatory, the South Pole, where uh, basically it's a huge detector, a cubic kilometer of, uh, of, of detectors, because neutrinos almost do not interact when, uh, when they, uh, basically they pierce uh, uh, the Earth, coming from, from astrophysical uh, sources. And uh, the, uh, the problem here is to classify, basically to, to distinguish between background events and astrophysical neutrinos coming from distant uh, uh, objects. So uh, the, one of the difficulties of this problem is that uh, the SNR is very low. So you have a lot of background noise and very few interactions. And here, uh, graph neural networks perform much better than, than the baseline. So another application, uh, talking about a uh, completely different topic, social networks, uh, uh, recommend the systems. We talked about it briefly. So probably the first application at large scale, basically at web scale, was at Pinterest. So again, uh, Yuri Lesko is from Stanford. He is uh, also involved with, with Pinterest. So they did uh, uh, the work they, they call um, uh, PinSage that uh, is applied at uh, uh, graphs with uh, hundreds of millions of nodes and billions of edges. And uh, uh, we also did a work on social networks uh, looking at how news spread on social media. Uh, this is an example of a story that propagates on Twitter, starting from this big red node, and then uh, then it spreads out. Actually, it seems that uh, fake news and real news, whatever it means, uh, spread differently on, on Twitter or in, in other social media. So by learning these propagation patterns, it is possible to tell a part between uh, truth and, and fake stories. And this was uh, a company called Fabula that uh, uh, was acquired by Twitter uh, uh, three months ago. So now that's how I got into Twitter, uh, basically as part of this acquisition. Uh, another application from the domain com of computer vision is uh, dealing with adversarial noise. You probably heard about 
uh, these works where you can perturb a single pixel in an image and this completely uh, produces completely different uh, wrong classification of the image. Like take uh, a cat, change one pixel in a particular way and it will be classified as a bird. It can be used uh, in it as a targeted attacks. For example, you can take uh, a traffic sign, uh, modify it a little bit by putting a sticker on it and for example, uh, an autonomous car will speed up and kill a, a pedestrian, right? So it can be potentially also very dangerous. And uh, the way that usually this problem is addressed is you take an input image, you add some noise to it that might be image dependent or actually universal, it depends only on the neural network that is given to you and uh, it makes the network misclassify the, the inputs. So this is a well-known property of uh, convolutional neural networks, I would say to some extent worrisome. Uh, with graph neural networks, we looked into how to defend against adversarial perturbations, basically by adding regularization layers into standard neural networks. And the way that it works, basically we look at neighbors in the space of images. So we don't consider a single image, like a standard neural network will, would do, but we also consider relations between multiple images, basically representing them as, as a graph. And the graph basically accumulates uh, aggregated information from pixels in multiple images, so basically we don't look only at neighbors in one image, but in the, uh, look at neighbors uh, at multiple images, and uh, this way we show that you can, do, uh, you can gain significant robustness to adversarial perturbations. Uh, this is the, the accuracy as a result of increasing the noise of the, uh, the, the strength of this adversarial noise, and you see that uh, uh, it takes much uh, more effort to fool uh, this neural network. So this is not imperceivable noise. It's uh, very structured and uh, very clearly visible. And uh, talking about adversarial attacks, actually there are uh, recently some works on adversarial attacks on graphs. It is way more complicated and more, much more interesting than adversarial attacks on images, in my opinion. Basically on a graph, imagine that uh, you have a social network, right? So think of Facebook or Twitter and you want uh, uh, so to attack a node, let's say you want to attack a, a user called Donald Trump, right? So you can, uh, first of all, you can uh, do it by uh, changing the features uh, of the edges or the, uh, um, or, 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 or the nodes, uh, the features of the users. You can also change the topology of the graph, right? I can, for example, like or follow users and the topology of the graph will change. So here you can actually have a target node and attack it through other nodes. For example, I change my behavior in order to uh, uh, in order to influence or in order to attack somebody else. So the the, the variety of problems uh, uh, of uh, adversarial attacks on graphs is much more uh, much richer and much more interesting than uh, in images. So let me just briefly recap what we've seen uh, last time, and then we move. Yeah. Question. Yes, so basically on graphs it's more complicated. Uh, it, uh, usually it, is, uh, it boils down to, uh, to a bi-level optimization problem. Yeah. But, yeah, there are, there are, uh, so uh, the, one of the challenges is that the graph is uh, basically it's a discrete structure. So you cannot continuously remove or uh, add an edge. So some problems can be formulated in these terms, for example, changing the, the, uh, 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 the features. Uh, some cannot. Changing the topology, for example, cannot be formulated in this way. Okay, so basically uh, I hope I convinced you that, that graphs are uh, interesting objects. They can model uh, interactions and relations. They are applicable in many fields. Uh, you can build in uh, uh, basically some structure into your uh, neural architecture. So therefore the model uh, in principle can be applied with uh, much less parameters, maybe less training data. Uh, you can do convolutional neural networks on graphs, right? Using something similar to convolutions in the traditional sense. Uh, using uh, spectral techniques or uh, 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 using something that is inspired by spectral techniques but essentially boils down to diffusion on the graph. Uh, there is a lot of different models at the end. Uh, what is probably important is to incorporate uh, problem-specific knowledge like taking molecular graphs. These are uh, molecules are not just any graphs. They have certain rules that are pretty strict about how the graph is constructed. There are many uh, interesting applications, some potentially groundbreaking, like uh, computational drug design is one of them. And uh, some open problems, uh, generation of graphs is challenging. There are some works, but I think none of them is really answering this problem. Usually it's small graphs or very high computational complexity. 
uh, scaling to uh, very large graphs like social networks is challenging. So this is still an open problem. Uh, it is interesting, actually, uh, recently there, there, is, uh, there are several works trying to understand how powerful are graph neural networks. Also, one of the promising directions is to relate uh, graph neural networks to classical problems in computer science, like quadratic assignment or traveling salesman. You can actually approximate these problems using graph neural networks. So it is interesting if it works both ways. Uh, can you learn some heuristics for solving these problems that maybe are unknown? Or maybe can you guarantee certain behaviors uh, of the graph neural network from uh, some bounds maybe on, on, on these theoretical problems? Uh, interpretability is interesting. Uh, and uh, if you model your uh, data as graphs, uh, basically, graph already offers you some interpretability, maybe in some situations, because uh, it relates, uh, relates things, right? So you, can, you, know, you might gain some insight about it. And it's also interesting, well, uh, the topic of algorithmic fairness and ethics is, uh, is now uh, prominent in, in artificial intelligence. So uh, there are already some papers that look at uh, graph embeddings and how to make them uh, 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 computationally fair, basically not to discriminate against certain uh, populations. Okay, so let me switch to a different topic and uh, we'll be talking about uh, computer graphics and uh, 3D computer vision applications. So again, you can find the slides here. Uh, that's the second part of the uh, uh, second part of this uh, lecture. And uh, basically, if we consider before graphs, we now we'll be looking at. You want the link? Yeah. Uh, now we'll be looking at uh, manifolds, surfaces, uh, meshes, point clouds. So basically, uh, different uh, representations of uh, three-dimensional objects. Okay, and uh, very luckily, Justin has covered a large part of it, so you know probably now by heart what uh, manifolds are, what is the Laplacian operator. So I will uh, run very briefly through this. So there are many applications in computer graphics and computer vision where uh, these methods can be applied. Uh, for example, this, uh, uh, well, even in rendering, in uh, virtual augmented reality, in robotics, autonomous driving, uh, medicine, uh, and drug design. I will try to show some examples, but uh, I guess you might know even better some uh, more interesting applications. So we've seen this uh, slightly controversial claim that data is more important than algorithms. Uh, it was for sure true in computer vision. Uh, let's see what's the situation in uh, uh, 3D computer vision and computer graphics. So the situation used to be pretty bad, I would say, in the past. So if you, uh, if you uh, uh, go back in time 20 years ago, computer graphics research used something like half a dozen of uh, common objects like the Stanford Bunny or the Utah Teapot. Uh, 10 years ago, there would be uh, data sets of maybe a few thousands of shapes like the Princeton Shape Retrieval Benchmark. Nowadays, you can find uh, a lot of different uh, 3D objects, whether from uh, uh, public domain uh, repositories, people can actually uh, uh, can design their own objects, 3D print them. Uh, uh, there is uh, three-dimensional data from uh, biomedical uh, applications uh, like the UK Biobank that collects information, including imaging data from uh, probably millions of patients. And also uh, uh, there are 3D sensors that allow you to scan your favorite 3D objects uh, at video rate and high resolution. So this has evolved also dramatically in the past 15 years. If uh, 15 years ago you would uh, buy a big box like this that would cost like a small car to, to scan your 3D objects, nowadays uh, you can find a small 3D sensor in your uh, iPhone 10, right? And I was involved, my, one of my previous startups was acquired by Intel that uh, has become uh, uh, what Intel calls the real sense technology. So it's a family of small uh, embedded uh, sensors that go into laptops, uh, tablets, drones, and whatever, you name it. And here are examples of computers where these sensors were uh, integrated. Uh, don't understand why the videos are not working. Well, uh, tough luck. So uh, basically these are two prototypical uh, problems in uh, 3D computer vision and graphics. Imagine that uh, you have a motion capture system, right? So you scan a 3D object in real time using, let's say, Kinect or any other your favorite 3D sensor. And uh, you first establish, uh, basically what you want to do is uh, a synthetic object that repeats uh, the motion of the input, 
right? So you have a human body, an actor that performs in front of the sensor, you want a computer animated character that does exactly the same thing, preferably in real time, right? So if the video worked, I could show you how it works. Uh, so basically there are two problems here, right? The first problem is correspondence. So you have some canonical body shape that you uh, first correspond to the input. And second problem is uh, the problem of, so we can call this the analysis problem. The second problem is synthesis. You basically, you take this canonical object and you deform it. Uh, basically, you produce a new object in the, in the desired pose, let's say, right? So we'll be talking about uh, both uh, these problems, the analysis and the synthesis. Now, if you look at the problem of, uh, let's say if you look at the problem of correspondence or problem of similarity, basically, it is very well studied in the case where the deformations are isometric. And I remind you, isometric is kind of bending that doesn't stretch, right? So that, that preserves the, 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 the metric properties of the surface. When the shapes are non-isometric, so roughly speaking, a different pose of the same human is approximately an isometry, but two different people are usually not isometric. For example, somebody can be very thin and tall and somebody can be very short and fat, right? So the, 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 these are not isometries. And also it can become infinitely complicated. So you can, for example, uh, uh, maybe some parts are missing because it's acquired by a 3D sensor. So you want to solve a partial correspondence problem. Maybe it's a different representation. Your canonical uh, model is a mesh and you want to correspond it to a point cloud, right? So basically the spectrum of problems here is wide and, and complicated. So if you ask me how to address Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, you would obviously uh, write the answer 10 years ago would be uh, build some uh, feature descriptor, right? Something that was also done in computer vision. So there was w w roughly with the leg of something like five years, there was an analogy for 3D, 3D data of the popular descriptors from computer vision, whether it's SIFT, SURF, and, and uh, shape context, and so on and so forth. The problem, of course, with uh, handcrafted descriptors is that they are not task specific. So let me give you an example. If you were to solve the problem of correspondence between different human shapes, I want my descriptor to be as insensitive as possible to the individual characteristics of the person, right? I don't care uh, how your nose is, for example, shaped. I, what I want to tell that this is a nose, right? Because I want to correspond it across different shapes in my collection. But if I were to recognize, uh, to tell apart different people, actually the individual characteristics are the key uh, features that would allow me to tell apart between two different people, right? So you see that in these two applications, the descriptor that you would use would be completely different. And it's very hard to design something axiomatically, basically some handcrafted descriptor that is good for a specific task. So that's why uh, deep learning uh, is uh, probably the right paradigm to, for these kind of problems because you, uh, you have some generic black box and you fine tune it for the specific task by uh, basically by <coughs> minimizing some cost function. Okay, so what we want to do is to apply deep learning to 3D data. So you can, uh, when talking about 3D data, uh, the, probably the difference between uh, geometric objects like uh, 3D shapes and graphs is that you can think of it in two ways. You can think of it intrinsically as a manifold, right? Or as a graph maybe, which will be some uh, cheap representation of this uh, surface. Or you can also think of them as objects in the, uh, uh, in the ambient 3D space, right? So in principle, you can take your objects, for example, you can rasterize it. So think of it as a volumetric model, right? A three-dimensional matrix and apply, for example, three-dimensional convolutional networks, right? Or instead of two-dimensional filters, you have three-dimensional filters. So I will not talk about uh, these methods. Well, there is an uh, entire chapter in 3D computer vision uh, uh, research that, that tries to do it, whether it's multiple views, for example, image-based representations or volumetric representations. There are many reasons why it's a bad idea uh, to do it, to, to handle 3D objects this way. One of them is lack of invariance. If I rotate my object, the representation will change, right? So same way as uh, convolutional neural networks are not uh, invariant to rotations of the image, here you can imagine all the 3D rotations, let alone deformations, right? So if I want, in some situations, if I want to deal with deformable shapes, you will need a lot of examples of deformed shapes to say, to say that that's exactly the same thing, right? It's just deformed in different ways because the Euclidean representation, let's say the, the rasterized, the volumetric representation will be uh, very different for these shapes. 
So I would like to focus on surface-based representation where we treat 3D shapes as two-dimensional manifolds, as surfaces that represent the, the, basically the boundaries of three-dimensional objects. And you've seen, uh, I, let me try to understand why this is not working. This is much better. So basically, the, the key point, what we try to achieve is this. Basically, we want to, an intrinsic definition of uh, basic operations on uh, meshes such as uh, convolutions. And you can see an example here. So if I have a deformable uh, surface, in this case, just a piece of paper with a checkerboard on it, if I apply a filter, like a standard 2D convolutional neural network will do, you see that if I deform the, uh, the surface, the result will change. Right, the way that the filter is applied. So what I want to do is to define the filter on the surface itself, intrinsically. Basically using some local representation, local system of coordinates and notions that you've seen before in Justin's talk, like the Laplacian operator, uh, which give, gives rise to, for example, to diffusion kernels and so on and so forth. Okay, and basically uh, taking it back to the philosophy that we actually want to be less generic. So if we go from fully connected neural networks that are known to be universal approximators to convolutional neural networks that make assumption about shift equivariance, uh, we want to basically build in these uh, deformation invariants, invariance to isometries into our neural network architecture. This way, for example, we don't need to uh, show the neural network all the possible examples of deformations of an object because uh, uh, the convolution operation will be invariant to these deformations. Okay? And we'll see, as, as before with graphs, uh, two different ways of uh, realizing these convolution operations in the spectral domain and in the spatial domain. Okay? So let's start with a brief recap about manifolds. So manifold, uh, basically the main difference between a manifold and a Euclidean space is that you cannot add uh, or subtract two points on the, on the surface. Right? So you need uh, some local representation, uh, which is called the, the, the tangent space, or for two-dimensional surfaces, tangent plane. So basically, it's uh, uh, locally around the point, you can think of your manifold as Euclidean space. But you don't, uh, basically, you cannot uh, uh, add or subtract these two points. So the way of measuring uh, 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 distances and angles on, uh, uh, in this tangent space is done using the Riemannian metric. Basically, it's an inner product that is defined uh, in each tangent space and rise smoothly uh, when I move from one tangent space to another one. An isometry is a deformation that preserves uh, the Riemannian metric structure. So if you take a piece of paper and you bend it without stretching, that would be an isometry, right? So an animal that lives on this, uh, on this piece of paper will not perceive any difference, right? So that would be, that would be an isometric deformation. And we call properties that can be expressed entirely in terms of the Riemannian metric uh, intrinsic, right? So when I talk about intrinsic geometry or intrinsic constructions, that's something that can be expressed in terms of, of, of this inner product, okay? Now, as before on graphs, and you can actually see that uh, we can see a complete analogy between what we've seen yesterday and what we see now, even though uh, probably it's hard to imagine more different objects than uh, manifolds and graphs. Right? Even mathematicians that study them uh, don't uh, meet in the same corridors usually in, uh, in their departments, uh, usually don't attend the same conferences and probably quietly hate each other. Right? So, uh, but you will see that it's exactly the same thing from our perspective. So we are interested in calculus on, uh, on manifolds. We can define functions on manifolds, so we distinguish between two things. Uh, we, uh, we can define scalar fields, basically you can think of temperature of the surface at each point, right? So that's a scalar value. And we can think, and uh, another uh, type of functions that we want to define are vector fields. So vector fields, uh, you can visualize them as uh, a lot of arrows, uh, basically an arrow attached to each point. And you can think of it as a flow of stuff on your surface, right? So technically, these are functions that take you from a point on the manifold to uh, a direction in the tangent space, right? Tangent space is two-dimensional uh, uh, vector space here, okay? By T of X, I uh, denote the disjoint union of all the tangent spaces that is called the tangent bundle. And as before, we can uh, uh, define a, a vector space of these functions. So we cannot treat the points on the manifold as a vector space, but we can treat functions on the manifold as, uh, as a vector space. So we can add and subtract functions. 
on the manifold. And we equip it with a standard inner product. So you've seen this also in Justin's, uh, uh, in Justin's lecture. Uh, I, I will not repeat it. So we can do it for scalar and vector fields. And uh, we can define differential operators. So a differential tells you how uh, the value of the function changes when you make a small step from uh, around the point. And basically, you make a step in a certain direction in the tangent, spa uh, in the tangent space. And uh, basically, by representation theorem, you can represent it as, uh, as a vector in the tangent space that is called the, uh, the, the intrinsic gradient. Uh, basically, that uh, uh, roughly generalizes the notion of uh, directional derivative. Right? And uh, you can think of this intrinsic gradient as an operator that takes you from, basically, it, it uh, inputs uh, a scalar field and produces, uh, produces a vector field. Okay, same thing, uh, you can define the divergence operator as we've seen before, right? So the analogy of these uh, scalar and vector fields are the vertex and the edge fields that we've seen before on graphs. Okay, so divergence operator does uh, exactly the opposite. And uh, these, these two operators are adjoint. And finally, the Laplacian, it's an operator that takes a function, a scalar function, and produces a scalar function. And again, you can uh, interpret it as the difference between the value of the function at the point and the uh, average of the values of the function in a small neighborhood around, uh, around this point. And it has a bunch of nice properties. It, it is intrinsic, so you can express it entirely in terms of the Riemannian metric. As a result, it's invariant to isometries. It is self-adjoint, or if you think of it as a matrix, it's a symmetric matrix. As a result, it has orthogonal eigenfunctions, and the way that we define it, right, there is some ambiguity regarding the sign of the Laplacian. Here we define it as positive semi-definite, so it has no negative eigenvalues. As we've seen yesterday, you can interpret them as frequencies. So we'll use it for our free analysis. And on, uh, in practice, we don't work with continuous surfaces. We discretize them. So typically, in computer graphics, uh, you work with meshes. So on triangular meshes, you can uh, discretize the Laplacian using this uh, cotangent formula. Bottom line, it's a large sparse matrix for which you can do different computations, such as computing the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And here is the eigen decomposition of the of the uh, of this uh, Laplacian matrix, as we've seen yesterday with graphs. It works exactly the same. So you see, basically, once you constructed the Laplacian operator, and, uh, written it as a matrix, you forget about what was the underlying domain from which it, uh, uh, from which it arises. It doesn't really matter whether it's a graph or a manifold. Basically, all the rest of the operations, well, once you use the, uh, the uh, uh, the Laplacian or quantities that are derived from the Laplacian are exactly the same, right? So here is an example of uh, eigenvectors of the Laplacian on, on, uh, on the human shape. So you can see that uh, they are very similar to what we've seen yesterday on graphs. And this is also an orthogonal basis. You can uh, use it to do Fourier analysis, right? And uh, Justin showed it in his uh, slides, uh, Kladni plates, basically a way to see the sound and uh, here I have a slightly different video of the same experiment with a different shape. So you see that when the plate vibrates, the grain of sense form these patterns. And you can uh, basically, uh, the mathematical model of this is a wave equation. And if you look at the, at the wave equation, basically usually it is solved by separation of variables. So there is the temporal part and the spatial part. The spatial part satisfies uh, this uh, PDE that is called the Helmholtz equation, which is essentially it produces the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian operator uh, that are denoted here by phi, and lambdas are the corresponding eigenvalues. So these are the vibration frequencies and vibration modes of, uh, of the plate. Okay, and you can use eigenvalues, as, uh, also as you've seen in the previous lecture, as a kind of shape descriptors. So basically, they are invariant to isometries, right? Basically, if I deform the plate, the Laplacian, because it's intrinsic, will produce exactly the same eigenvalues. So here you can see different deformations, near isometric deformations of different classes of shapes. You see that they produce nearly identical uh, uh, eigenvalues of, uh, of the Laplacian. So these can be used as uh, shape descriptors. And uh, obviously there is a question, uh, how informative are the Laplacian eigenvalues about the structure of the shape? You can see that you can recover a lot of uh, geometric and topological properties of the shape from the, uh, from the spectrum. You can see it from the heat trace expansion, you can recover the area, you can recover the, the, the genus. Uh, the question is whether you can recover the metric. So the answer is uh, negative, right? You've seen it before, right? I isometric uh, shapes are isospectral, but not necessarily the opposite. So 
formulating it as uh, this question of hearing the shape of the drum, the answer is negative because you can find counterexamples, but actually they are very exotic. And what we show, actually it was a paper at CUPR this year, that in practice you can hear the shape of the drum, you need to add some extra stuff, some uh, priors like smoothness, so you can here you can see an example of reconstruction of uh, a shape from its uh, Laplacian spectrum, actually partial spectrum. Okay. You can get pretty good reconstructions here. So it doesn't contradict the theoretical results here, we add some uh, extra priors, but extremely mild priors. Okay. So why do we need the Laplacian here? We need the eigenvectors of the Laplacian as the analogy of the Fourier transform, as we've seen yesterday. So we know that in classical Euclidean analysis, you can take a function and decompose it into sum of uh, sines or cosines, right? So what we call Fourier series or Fourier transform. You can do exactly the same thing in the Laplacian eigenbasis. So actually, the, uh, what we call the Fourier basis are the eigenfunctions of the Euclidean Laplacian. Here, we'll do exactly the same with the non-Euclidean Laplacian, with the Laplacian or the Laplace Beltrami operator of the, of the surface. Okay? So, we've seen already the heat equation, right? Uh, that is a partial differential equation that involves uh, the Laplacian. Uh, let's see how we uh, can use uh, uh, this uh, Fourier decomposition uh, to solve it. This is actually the reason why Fourier introduced Fourier series, basically, to solve uh, partial differential equations, in particular the heat equation, uh, actually the, the Fourier uh, series or Fourier transform was introduced in his uh, seminal work that was called the uh, theoretical, uh, uh, the, the analytic theory of heat. So he was, uh, uh, he was uh, solving uh, uh, heat equations uh, using this method that is now called uh, Fourier analysis. So here is uh, the simplest heat equation that you can imagine on the manifold. Basically, the heat equation with some initial conditions. We assume no boundaries or no boundary conditions. And uh, the solution of the heat equation is usually expressed through the heat operator, which is exponential of the Laplacian applied to the initial condition, right? And uh, basically, the exponential is applied uh, uh, to the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So here is how, uh, how it works. You take the initial condition, f naught, you uh, project it on the Fourier basis, right, on the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, so that, that's the inner product that you see. Then you uh, multiply it by the exponentiated eigenvalue, right? Then you multiply it by the eigenfunction and sum everything up, right? So that's the forward Fourier transform, filtering, and uh, inverse Fourier transform, right? So exponential, if you think of it, basically it has this parameter t. It's a low-pass filter that depends on the diffusion time the uh, longer it takes to diffuse, right, so the larger is t, the lower is uh, the frequency at which it cuts off. Uh, basically, it is, uh, it blurs, it's a blur operator, right? Let's do some, uh, 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 some uh, rearrangement to this formula. So let's write explicitly the, uh, this uh, inner product as an integral and uh, re exchange uh, summation and uh, an integration. Uh, the function that uh, is written here, given by this series, is called the heat kernel or the fundamental solution of the heat equation. You see that it depends on two coordinates, on x and x prime. And basically, you can interpret it as the amount of heat that is transferred from point x to point x prime in uh, time t. Okay? So, this is how a heat kernel looks like for, uh, at specific points, so at the white point on, the, on this horse. You see that at different points it will look differently. Right? Basically, it is defined intrinsically, uh, and also because it's intrinsic, it will follow the deformations of the of the object. Right? So, if you deform the horse, the heat kernel will follow. Right? So, it is uh, isometry invariant. Now, just a sanity check: in the Euclidean case, uh, basically the Fourier basis are the complex exponentials. Because of the associativity of the product, we get a heat kernel that depends not on two coordinates but on the difference between two coordinates. Right? So, usually in signal processing, this is called the impulse response, right? Basically, if you feed in uh, a direct delta, you will get out uh, uh, the heat kernel, right? So that's, uh, and uh, the result of the heat equation is essentially a convolution with the with heat kernel, okay? In the, the non-Euclidean case, it works almost the same way, but you don't have this convolution. You have something more complicated that is position dependent, okay? This is what we've seen. Before, right, and we talked yesterday extensively about convolution. Uh, so basically, it has uh, this property of 
commutativity with the, with the derivative, with the Laplacian operator, and you can actually define it this way, right? As something that commutes, a linear operation that commutes with the Laplacian, as a result, it is diagonalized by the Laplacian eigenbasis, so you can define it as a product in the Laplacian eigenbasis. That was our definition of spectral convolution, right? What we, what we did yesterday for graphs, so same thing works for manifolds, right? And that was our first recipe of how to define convolution on manifolds. Let me skip it. So basically, we take our signal, we apply the Fourier transform, right? We multiply by the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, then we multiply by some matrix of uh, diagonal matrix of spectral coefficients, that's the filter, and then compute inverse Fourier transform multiplying by phi. Okay, and we've seen that there are many deficiencies to this approach, first of, uh, of which was that the filters are basis dependent. Okay? So let me show you how exactly it works, basically, why it is basis dependent. So this is a function that is defined on this coarse surface, right? So it's blobs, zeros and ones, right? Let's apply some spectral filter that does kind of edge detection, right? So from these blobs, I become, uh, they, they become something like this, okay? Now, I will, I will deform the coarse object a little bit, right? I will move it like I've seen before. So as a result, the mesh will change, the Laplacian will slightly change, uh, the eigenvectors will also change, right? But the filter remains the same, so the matrix W remains the same. Do you think that the result will be as a result of the filter will be similar or different. So who thinks that it will be the same, it will remain the same? Who thinks that it will be different? Well, uh, and the rest are probably asleep. Okay, so it will be very different. You say that it's completely different actually. And uh, the reason is that uh, eigenvectors are unstable. So they can change order. This is the 50th eigen, eigenvector of the Laplace and you see that how it changes a lot, right? So basically, uh, it is a bad idea to, to the filtering in this way. Second problem that we've seen was uh, lack of localization. So we've seen that uh, if we design a filter in the spectral domain, it is not necessarily localized in the spatial domain. So in the classical uh, Fourier transform, we have this property that relates high order derivatives of the Fourier transform to high order moments of the function in the spatial domain. And basically, if we want something to be localized, we want the higher order moments to decay fast, right? Uh, it means that the higher order derivatives of the Fourier transform must vanish as well. It means that uh, spatial localization can be uh, equivalently formulated as smoothness in the frequency domain, okay? Now, it is a little bit subtle thing, how do you define smoothness? Because you need some geometric structure in the frequency domain. Uh, in case of images, for example, because uh, the Fourier transform comes from tensor product, you actually have a notion of two-dimensional uh, frequencies. In case of graphs or manifolds, uh, you usually don't, unless you know some, something, uh, something clever. But uh, the simplest uh, geometric structure is just to order the eigenvalues in increasing order, and this will be basically one-dimensional space. So you can think of smoothness with respect to the, to the, uh, to the eigenvalue, basically, as, as a scalar parameter. And uh, you can see an example here. So this is a non-smooth filter. When I apply it to the delta function at this white point, you see that it's not, it's not localized, right? So it's basically, it, uh, it covers the entire course. And this is a smooth filter. When I do the same thing, you see that it's nicely localized around the white point. Okay, and we've seen basically a better alternative uh, not to compute the Fourier transform explicitly, to use uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, filter function that can be expressed in terms of simple matrix multiplications, like a polynomial, right? And basically this allows to completely uh, bypass the need to compute uh, the, the Fourier transform. And it, it also has guaranteed uh, localization. The problem is when you apply this kind of filter to meshes, basically this R ring support means that uh, you depend on the way that the mesh is, uh, basically they depend on triangulation. So if you have a dense mesh, then it will be tiny filter support. If you have a coarse mesh, then the filter might be very large. So a better idea was uh, to use uh, rational filters, and uh, they are automatically uh, uh, independent on, uh, on the scale of the, of the mesh. Okay, so another interesting interpretation is this. So this is actually a joint work with, with Justin and his student. 
basically, if you think of meshes as uh, as operators, right? If I take a mesh and represent it as, for example, the Laplacian, right? Or it can be other operators as well. Let's call it A, right? Doesn't need necessarily to be Laplacian. And uh, what we want to learn is either local features or global features, right? So vertex-wise features, basically, I want some k-dimensional vector for each node of the of the mesh, or maybe a global feature that uh, is accumulated for represents the entire mesh. Think of, uh, for example, vertex-wise labeling, as we've seen before, or maybe classification of the entire 3D object, right? I want to recognize what, what this object is. And uh, let's say that we have two different uh, meshings of these, uh, 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 of these objects, denoted by xt and xt wave, right? So t denotes the, the, the triangulation, the, 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 the triangular faces of the mesh. Basically, what we assume here is that we have a map that maps functions from one mesh to another one uh, that can be represented uh, with respect to the Fourier basis by some matrix C. So it's uh, called functional maps. So this is also work uh, uh, that, that Justin did with, uh, with, with, with colleagues uh, from Stanford. Uh, and we assume that this, uh, uh, this map is area preserving. So this matrix C is, uh, is orthogonal. Basically, under these assumptions, uh, if we want to be uh, invariant to remeshing, it can be written in this way. Basically, this is the, the, this is the, the condition that we can impose on the uh, on the features of this uh, of this neural network and uh, basically under these assumptions uh, we can show that essentially what the neural network learns is some transformation of the spectrum of this operator what is obvious here is that the choice of the operator is up to you so it doesn't need to be Laplacian it can be something else actually this operator can be made learnable okay and that's uh, I think this nature uh, leads to uh, uh, basically what we discussed yesterday as well, spatial methods, how to define uh, operators uh, that are maybe different from the Laplacian and maybe more interesting, okay? And one of the issues that we've seen yesterday on graphs was the fact that uh, Laplacian operators or diffusion operators are not sensitive to directions. And uh, I, I said that on many folds we can do better and I will show you how to do better, how to make uh, diffusion that is sensitive to direction. So uh, one thing that we've seen before, right, basically the, uh, if you think of convolution as a, a kind of page-wise uh, uh, multiplication by some template on uh, non-Euclidean uh, domains like uh, surfaces, you need to account for the curvature, right, for the fact that when I move to another point, the page might look uh, differently. And uh, we've seen that this can be done by defining some local system of coordinates and a family of weighting functions in this system of coordinates. So uh, natural selection for these coordinates would be, for example, geodesic polar coordinates around each point. Okay, and usually these weights will be Gaussians. So here's an example of a polar system of coordinates. Basically, you measure geodesic distance from a point, that's the radial coordinate, and you measure the angle with respect to some canonical direction, that would be the, uh, the angular coordinate. Okay, and here you can see that uh, obviously one of the things is that uh, it is uh, the, the orientation of the system of coordinates is ambiguous, right? How to choose uh, theta equals zero, right? The origin of this uh, of this angular coordinate. So there are several ways we can do it by fixing some canonical direction, and uh, basically this requires uh, a way of defining some uh, vector field that is repeatable across deformations of the shape. Actually, again in this CPR we had a paper that that proposed uh, basically a, a, a general framework for doing it, but you can do something that is cheap and dirty, for example, take principal curvature direction. It's not exactly intrinsic, but it's good enough for things like human deformations. Uh, you can also do uh, pooling along uh, the angular directions, so you can uh, look at all the possible rotations and select the one that produces the largest filter response. So it's a kind of uh, applying a rotating filter and then selecting the one, uh, the direction that responds the, the, most, uh, the most. Or you can take Fourier transform, standard one-dimensional Fourier transform with respect to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, angular coordinate, and then uh, rotation ambiguity will be encoded as complex phase. And if you take absolute value, you get rid of this, uh, of this ambiguity, okay? So there are many ways of defining these weighting functions. Uh, you can either use a fixed family of weighting functions, or you can make a learnable one like we've seen in the uh, mixture model architectures. I will not uh, go into details. So this is an example of angular pooling, and you can learn optimal descriptors 
for meshes in this way. Basically, uh, standard Siamese architecture, you feed in uh, pairs of points, positives and negatives, right? So the corresponding points and non-corresponding points, and you try to learn uh, uh, basically a, a representation, a point-wise representation that is uh, as similar as possible for corresponding points and as dissimilar as possible for non-corresponding points. And it actually works significantly better than the standard descriptors like heat kernel signatures that, that Justin mentioned. Uh, basically, the learned descriptor is much better localized and much, it has much higher specificity. Okay, so let's talk about uh, uh, direction-sensitive diffusion, right? So we've seen already the, the, the heat equation, so I'm writing it slightly differently, right? So I'm writing now the Laplacian operator as a divergence of the gradient, right? And I put the diffusion, uh, the diffusivity constant uh, inside the divergence, right? Because it's scalar in uh, homogeneous diffusion, I can take it out, right? And then I will see uh, uh, the right-hand side will look like C Laplacian of F, right? Uh, why do I need to do it? Because I can put here something else. So I can make this, uh, this diffusivity constant position dependent, right? So it will be scalar valued function that depends on x. This is what is usually called uh, non-homogeneous diffusion, right? So the diffusion, uh, diffusion works, basically it is position sensitive but not direction sensitive. Or I can put here a matrix, right? Basically a matrix that has, a uh, two-way two matrix that has the dimensions of the gradient. And this is called an isotropic diffusion. So it is not only position dependent, it's also direction dependent, right? So this matrix tells us in which direction uh, the heat flows faster. Okay, and this is an example of how heat propagates from a point uh, in the isotropic case and in the anisotropic case, right? So you see that in the anisotropic case, it flows faster in the vertical direction. Now, vertical, of course, is not the right notion on a manifold. Basically, it's some intrinsic direction. Basically, it is guided by some, some tangent vector field. Okay, so the way that you can define it, basically, uh, you have the intrinsic gradient, right, that is defined, it's a vector in the tangent space. Then you rotate it by some rotation matrix with respect to some reference coordinate. That's uh, why uh, it's important to, to be able to define these, uh, these canonical directions. You scale it by some parameter alpha, right, so this gives the anisotropy. And then you rotate it back, right? And this gives us uh, uh, an anisotropic Laplacian that has uh, extra parameters, it has the, this uh, parameter alpha, basically how anisotropic it is, and theta, the direction of the, uh, uh, in which the diffusion uh, uh, works faster. Okay, and basically by changing these parameters, I can get these kind of diffusion kernels. Okay, so these are the heat kernels of uh, heat equation, uh, of anisotropic heat equation. Right, so basically you have local steerable filters on, uh, on the surface. And this is a way of defining these, uh, uh, these weighting kernels. So same way as we've seen yesterday on graphs, basically you can apply this diffusion matrix to propagate information on the graph. Here we can propagate information on, uh, on the manifold. Okay, and learnable patches, I already mentioned it, so uh, basically that was the, the monet architecture that we've seen on graphs. Obviously it generalizes uh, other constructions where the, uh, these uh, weighting functions are fixed. So let me say a few words about some applications. So, well, these models have been applied, uh, obviously, to problems in computer graphics and computer vision. Uh, I want to briefly talk about uh, uh, a little bit more exotic problem, but uh, uh, a very important one is uh, the analysis of protein molecules, right? So you know probably that protein is just a sequence of amino acids, right? That uh, fold into a very complex uh, three-dimensional structure. So you take this sequence by virtue of physical forces, uh, it folds into secondary structures that you see here, and then the secondary structures form the protein molecule. So basically the structure of the protein molecule is what uh, gives it its function. Basically proteins bind together, they stick like a, like a lock in the key, and uh, basically by functioning in these complexes, uh, you get different metabolic uh, activity, for example, in our body, or uh, basically essentially all life on Earth that we know is protein-based. We don't know any other forms of life currently. Right, so basically proteins are uh, essential building blocks of everything. Here's an, one application where uh, basically where this binding is very important, uh, uh, oncological immunotherapy. Uh, basically the way that, that it works is that uh, uh, in our uh, 
in our uh, cells, we have uh, a protein complex that is called PD-1, PD-L1. Basically, it signals to the immune system that uh, this is a healthy cell. And basically, it would not be attacked by, uh, by, by, the, uh, by the immune uh, system cells, by, by T cells, and will survive. Basically, some cancers learned to, to uh, express this protein, and so they become basically unrecognized by the immune system. So, uh, what uh, uh, immunotherapy does, it tries to block these receptors basically by creating a binder for these proteins in a way that uh, basically the standard immune response will kill the cancer cells. So, this is very roughly how this works. Uh, the uh, discovery of this, uh, uh, of this protein complex and its uh, uh, use for uh, immunotherapy was recognized by the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine last year. So, basically, the key problem here is how to design a protein that will bind to, to this complex or any, essentially any protein target. This is how drugs are developed. And uh, one of the promising directions is uh, basically to design a protein that will bind to another protein, what is called biological drugs or biologics. And you can do it computationally. So the way we do it is with genetic deep learning on uh, protein surfaces. Uh, basically, we can, uh, we can train a neural network that will uh, predict whether a protein, two proteins bind together or not. And it's more complicated than just geometric complementarity. Uh, there are also electrostatic forces. So it is hard to model, but you can learn it from examples. Basically, we learn from examples of proteins that are crystallized together, so they are known to bind. And uh, it works very nicely, actually. We have a paper uh, with collaborators from, uh, from Switzerland that, that shows that uh, uh, this can be done. Some results, for example, the, the, the PD-1 uh, protein is uh, an important target that, that we considered. You can see that here we predict uh, protein complexes almost perfectly. You can see the ground truth uh, here overlaid on the, on the prediction. And it's an interesting problem actually talking about uh, generative models. Usually the way that, uh, that uh, this design is done, you start with some structure and then you see that uh, it doesn't uh, perfectly fit. So you want somehow to locally modify your protein basically by changing the side chains of the amino acids that result in different, uh, different molecular surface. So this kind of generative model where you optimize for the side chains and see how it affects the, the, the protein structure is very interesting. You can probably also done with uh, generative uh, geometric models. But this is something that we have not done yet. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, we talked about uh, the analysis problems, right? Problems like, uh, like uh, shape correspondence. We can also talk about uh, synthesis problems, right? Uh, so I remind you that th this was an example of an application where we had uh, an input scan, let's say, we wanted to match it to some reference object and then deform the reference object to, uh, basically to, to make it, in, let's say, in the pose of the, of the input. So basically there are two problems, uh, the problem of finding correspondence and the problem of synthesizing the new shape. Okay? So the problem of correspondence can be formulated essentially as vertex-wise classification. You can say that I have some canonical shape, so let's consider it as a label space. And I want the neural network for each point on the manifold to produce uh, a label that represents uh, basically the, the, the position in, the, in, uh, in, this, in this canonical shape. So it can be uh, formulated using standard uh, cross entropy between, uh, between the ground rules correspondence and uh, the, uh, the output of the neural network, you can think of it as, basically, as probability distribution, right? What's the probability that point X on the input shape corresponds to point Y on the canonical shape, right? And uh, we can measure the error using the geodesic distance between the ground rules uh, and uh, the, the predicted point. And if you look at the, uh, these, uh, these are the typical plots that are, uh, that are shown in uh, uh, shape correspondence uh, papers. Basically, you uh, look at certain tolerance, basically uh, radius around the ground rules, and you see how many matches fall within this tolerance. So the higher, the better, right? And the, the, the curve shows uh, the, the fraction of the correspondences uh, that fall within this tolerance. You see that, for example, with mixture model architecture, we got almost uh, perfect correspondence. So uh, about 90% uh, of uh, points fall within uh, actually hit exactly the, the, uh, the, right, uh, the right, the ground rules point. And here you can uh, represent the, the correspondence error, basically the distance from the ground rules as a heat map. So blended intrinsic map is one of the popular methods uh, that is used in computer graphics. You see that it produces pretty poor, even though smooth correspondences. 
this is what you get, let's say, with mixture model networks. So it's uh, very tiny uh, uh, distortions. You can uh, probably even better see it if you overlay some texture like checkerboard on the reference shape and you, then you map it uh, to, the, uh, to the input shapes using this, uh, uh, this correspondence algorithm. You see that the distortions are almost uh, imperceivable. And here are some examples with more challenging cases where you have partial correspondence and, and, and topological noise. Okay. So uh, this was uh, the way of modeling correspondence as uh, basically as uh, uh, whether you, as a classifier, right? Whether you hit the uh, the ground truth point or not. But this is not a good model for correspondence, right? Because it will not distinguish between these two cases, right? So if my ground truth is gray, and I have uh, uh, two candidates, I have a candi uh, the green candidate, the green correspondence, and the blue correspondence, which one is better? The blue, right? It's closer, right? So it's it's a better correspondence. I'm off from my ground rules, but maybe a little bit off. Uh, uh, but the previous criterion, right? The cross entropy wouldn't uh, uh, penalize differently the two correspondences. Both are bad from that perspective, right? Because none of them really hits uh, the, the ground rules. So we can uh, represent it differently. Basically, we can weight. Uh, we get a probability distribution. We can weight it by the geodesic distance from the ground rules, right? So basically, I want all my uh, probability to be concentrated at the ground truth, right? So basically, I have some some, some, some metric, and I have a, uh, I have a probability. So I can uh, I can tell how uh, uh, how good my, uh, my my correspondence is. So this is a, a, a better criterion. Second problem that uh, during training time we can uh, minimize uh, uh, minimize some uh, meaningful criterion, some meaningful quality of correspondence. We cannot guarantee during inference time that nearby points will correspond to nearby points, right? And uh, basically, we want uh, some kind of structured prediction. We want uh, uh, the fact that uh, I corresponds to J to somehow condition uh, uh, the correspondence of a nearby point I prime, okay? So one way of doing it is to use functional maps. So functional maps is uh, a way of representing correspondence as linear operators. So usually when you think of correspondence, you think of pointwise correspondence, right? So it's a map that maps points from one shape to another shape. So this is a, a, a different paradigm for representing correspondence. So this is work by Max Ovsianikov and Colsers, including Justin. And uh, basically what the, uh, the way that they think of correspondence is as an operator that maps functions from one shape to another shape, right? So here you can see this red blob uh, F that is mapped uh, to a red blob G on another shape. Why, why this is a good model? You can compactly represent this, uh, this mapping, basically by decomposing these functions f and g in the Fourier basis on uh, each of the shapes, right? So you decompose, as we've seen before, basically by projecting the function on these bases, and you get uh, some Fourier coefficients that represent this function. Now, you can compactly represent, if you truncate the Fourier series of the first k coefficients, you can represent the correspondence as a matrix C, that is of size k by k, that basically corresponds to the Fourier coefficients, okay? And uh, if you have a sufficient number of known corresponding functions, some kind of probe functions, you can uh, write the correspondence problem as a linear system of equations, right? So I want to find such C that will uh, put in correspondence these uh, known probe functions, okay? So G hat and F hat here represent the Fourier coefficients of these, uh, these known correspondences. So basically, we can incorporate it into our neural network. Basically, we want to learn descriptors that will produce optimal functional maps. Okay, so let me show you how we do it. Basically, just to write, uh, to write this system of equation, we usually solve it in, uh, uh, in the least square sense, right? Usually, it's overcomplete, and it has a closed form expression, right? You can write it as, sorry, you can write it as uh, the pseudo inverse of uh, f multiplying g, okay? So you can also think of it uh, in the spatial domain, basically you can think of it as a low rank approximation of this uh, correspondence operator, right? So the way that it works, you first take a function, you compute its Fourier transform, then you map the Fourier coefficients to the new basis and you do synthesis in the new basis, okay? So if I have these uh, colored delta functions, uh, 
the uh, red, uh, green, and blue dot, they will uh, basically the functional uh, map will map them into these uh, uh, the blobs of the corresponding color. Okay, so they are not necessarily they uh, uh, you cannot necessarily uh, think of them as uh, as probability distributions. They actually can can have negative values. So we can uh, normalize it. Basically, take absolute value and, and normalize to make it a, a probability distribution. Okay, and that's exactly what we do. So basically. If before to construct optimal descriptors we use Siamese architecture that what, uh, that required that uh, uh, descriptors at corresponding points are as similar as possible at uh, non-corresponding points they're, they're as dissimilar as possible. Here we can do an entire functional map. So the uh, the neural network produces some features that are. There. Yeah, they are then fed into the computation of the functional map, right? So you project them on the uh, on the Laplacian basis, and then you uh, compute the functional map by uh, basically by pseudo inverse, right? Pseudo inverting f, and uh, you use this c to produce uh, this uh, probability distribution, right? And on this probability distribution, you can apply your criterion of uh, correspondence that, that that we formulated before. So the basically you need to back propagate through pseudo inverse. And here, actually, the uh, modern deep learning tools uh, come very handy because you can do it, in, for example, in TensorFlow or in PyTorch. Okay? So this gives you uh, these, these structured correspondence. We call these functional map networks. And actually, they produce extremely accurate results. So it saturates this Princeton uh, benchmark uh, on, uh, on the Faust data set, uh, data set of, uh, of deformable uh, human bodies. Okay, so in the remaining time, let me uh, say a few words about uh, shape synthesis problems. So we've seen uh, the problems of analysis. Let's talk about synthesis. So here we want to generate a new shape uh, that looks like a human, right? So what we can do is the following thing. We can, uh, here we can distinguish actually between two settings where we want to generate just the embedding of the shape. So we want to generate the coordinates of the points or we also want to generate the mesh. So here I assume the easier problem where we know that there is some canonical mesh. So let's say we, we have canonical human body. We just want to predict the positions of the points, right? But the mesh always remains the same. So what is crucial here that we know the ordering of the points, right? Remember that when we uh, talked about generative models for graphs, one of the key issues was that we didn't know the order of the, of the vertices. Here we assume that we know it. We just want to predict the points. So we can uh, basically create an autoencoder architecture that starts from a mesh, basically takes the, as input the coordinates of the vertices of the mesh, then uh, applies a series of convolutional filters on this mesh, and then uh, pulls everything into a vector, right? So that will be a, a, some latent representation of the meshes. And then from this vector, you go back to predict the coordinates uh, and you minimize some uh, let's say Euclidean distance between corresponding points between the original mesh and the reconstructed mesh, right? The decoder of the uh, of the encoder of X. Okay. Now, basically, there is nothing special about uh, about this architecture. It's just uh, the standard convolutions that are typically used, let's say, in image analysis and computer vision, are replaced by these intrinsic convolutions on the mesh. Now, the way that we use it, we then discard the encoder. We only keep the decoder. And the premise here is that uh, we believe that uh, when the network was trained, basically this latent space uh, represents uh, meaningful and plausible human shapes. So if I basically, if I generate a random vector and I uh, generate a, a mesh out of it, then it will produce something that looks like a human. Then we can solve a bunch of interesting problems. For example, we can uh, get a partial input and we can generate a shape that matches this partial input. So using some kind of uh, ICP distance. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it actually works pretty nicely. So uh, you can do uh, uh, things like shape completion. So that was actually more or less the only application where we tested it. That was a, a collaboration with um, people from Google. So at that time, it produced uh, results that were better than anything else. It doesn't look perfect, but it, it looks plausible. You can also apply it to, to for example, to point clouds. Uh, or, to, or uh, to, to, to scans with uh, a lot of missing details. Overall, it produces nice uh, shape completion. 
Now, uh, this was the first intrinsic uh, autoencoder architecture. I think uh, Michael Black uh, from MPI has taken it to a completely different level in terms of the quality of results, but the, but the, 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 the idea is more or less the same. So they have the, 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 the comma architecture that is very similar to what we did. Uh, it just produces better results. Uh, so we can generate uh, different shapes. We can generate faces, for example. We can do, in this latent space, we can do uh, interpolation and extrapolation. So here you can see interpolation between different shapes, uh, between different uh, facial expressions. Uh, so this is another example. You can do uh, arithmetics, right? Same way as you do it for images, you can do it also for, for 3D shapes. So you can, for example, take this uh, uh, person with an open mouth and subtract the neutral shape, then add uh, a male face, right? And you will get the male in the pose of the female. So same way as it's done, for example, with word embeddings or with image embeddings. And uh, one of the cool projects where we try to apply it is uh, uh, to predict uh, the structure of the face uh, from genetic information. Basically, we call it face from DNA. So as you know, genetics has a lot to do with the way that uh, the, the, the structure of face looks like. So even understanding what kind of, to which extent this prediction is possible is a very interesting problem. Uh, obviously, part is genetically driven, uh, other part is driven by, by, the, by environmental factors, but it seems that you can do a uh, uh, pretty nice prediction at least of some parts of the face from, uh, 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 from genetic information. You can think also of forensic applications where you have uh, this kind of multi-model face recognition. Imagine that the police finds, uh, I don't know, a genetic sample blood drop on the crime scene and you want to uh, uh, and you have a set of suspects, right? That you, for example, that, that you scan their faces, you want to match them to this DNA. So you have this multi-model metric that one input is, uh, is, a, is a genetic uh, information, another one is geometric information. And you want, uh, uh, you want some score that tells whether this, uh, uh, this is plausible match or not, right? So uh, in particular, the way that the genetic information is represented is uh, as a vector of SNPs single nucleotide polymorphism. So this is something that, for example, a sequencing service such as 23andMe will give you. Yeah. It's a good question. So uh, if you look at them, they look, uh, they look plausible. Whether they geometrically they are similar, that's, uh, that's a different question. So uh, unfortunately, this field has been a little bit compromised by uh, basically this kind of overselling uh, results that show nice pictures and, and, uh, and people believe that, uh, that this reconstruction is, uh, is easy. Uh, it is more complicated than that. So there are some parts of the face that, that are easy to predict, some, some parts are harder. Yeah. But to some extent it is, it is possible. Yeah. Sorry? I, uh, I can. What kind of structure? You mean to to, re, to 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 do shape completion for faces? Yeah. So we. We'll, or for for molecules? No, we have not tried to do it. No. So basically, we assume that the molecules are. Uh, Given and uh, basically they are given as a graph. We recover, uh, we we produce the molecular surface from uh, from the uh, from the graph of the protein, from the, basically from the positions of the atoms. Okay, uh, so here is another example. So we can also do it for hands. Basically, you can do it for uh, the entire body or different uh, body parts. So here is an example actually of an interesting architecture where the encoder is a standard uh, convolutional neural network. So the input is a two-dimensional image. And the decoder is a mesh CNN that predicts the 3D, uh, the 3D structure of the, of the hand. And uh, it works actually very nicely. So you can reconstruct, basically from a single image, you can reconstruct uh, the 3D structure of the hand. We have ground rules because uh, here, basically, the hand was also scanned uh, by a 3D sensor. And it matches the ground rules very nicely. It has some difficulties with uh, improbable poses that you usually don't see, like single finger, for example, for some reason. Uh, it's hard to reconstruct something like this, for example, which doesn't statistically probably doesn't happen very very often. But overall, it's 
it, it works very very nicely and uh, probably we have state of the art results. So it's a paper that will appear in BMVC uh, this year. And also it deals with uh, complicated poses. So here it's not perfect, but basically you have occlusion, so you don't really see the thumb, right? Basically it's hidden uh, between the, the other fingers. Okay, so I think I'm uh, almost finished here. Let me say just a few words about other representations that are based on point clouds, right? And point clouds are a popular representation in uh, autonomous driving uh, systems where you have uh, input about the environment coming from lighter sensors, right? So basically it's, it's scanning laser that, that moves on, let's say, on your favorite self-driving car and uh, produces a, a large point cloud that basically represents where the, the, uh, this laser beam was reflected from, from the object. Now, basically, if you think of a point cloud, it's a set, right? And we want uh, to do uh, deep learning on a set. So, uh, basically, there, there have been some works on uh, learning on sets, but uh, in this context of three-dimensional uh, uh, data analysis, the first application of these ideas was uh, in a work that is uh, now very famous, that is called PointNet, from the group of Leo Gibbs at Stanford. And basically, one thing to understand about, uh, about, uh, about sets is that any function that you can apply to a set must be permutation invariant, right? You don't have a, a way of canonically ordering your points, right? So basically, if I have a function that is applied to a set of points x1 for xn, it must uh, survive the reordering of the points that I denote here by pi, by permutation pi. And the way that it is implemented in point net is by using a shared function that is, uh, basically it's parametric, it's implemented as, as a small neural network, as a multi-layer perceptron, that here is called h, that is applied to each point, right? So in a sense, it's a very boring architecture. It's uh, basically, it applies some spatial uh, transformation to the, uh, to the input point cloud, right? If the point cloud is three-dimensional, right? If it's just a set of points, the, the coordinates of the points, you can also add some extra information such as color, maybe normal direction, but let's say for simplicity, it's just the input is n by three, right? So it's n points, each has three-dimensional coordinates, x, y, and z. So you apply some neural network that produces, let's say, 64-dimensional feature vector, and it's the same neural network that acts on every point. So it's a shared function. And then you apply it in sequence, you can also do some feature transformation. So you can basically, you can, you can uh, 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 apply transformer networks, basically canonically align, uh, align these points. So it's very simple, very lightweight, very fast architecture. It produces quite nice results. Uh, uh, there are many, uh, technical details how to make it uh, work in practice, but it was shown to, to, uh, to work uh, nicely in many applications, whether it's object recognition, whether it's uh, semantic segmentation, uh, prediction of uh, local properties such as curvature normals, and even generative models that generate point clouds of objects from, for example, for shape completion, from partial information, even from, from images. So somehow, if you look at this, can we do better? Basically, a point cloud, it's not just a set. You have some local structure, right? So you have some information. And uh, you just need to represent it in some way. So there are, there are works that try, for example, to feed some geometric primitives, uh, for example, planes uh, to point clouds. So uh, the easiest way probably uh, to introduce structure is in the form of a graph, right? So Justin talked about it in high dimensions, basically, where you take a point cloud and you compute uh, k-nearest neighbor graph or epsilon neighbor graph that somehow captures the local structure. So we can do the same thing for point cloud. It actually doesn't need to be a three-dimensional point cloud, but with three-dimensional point clouds, it's, uh, it's nicely visualized. So basically, you capture the local structure with a graph. It might be actually a bad model from a geometric perspective, but it's better than nothing, right? So it's uh, uh, basically, the, if you think of a zero-order uh, approximation of your object, is just considered as a set. That's first-order approximation, right? Something better would be uh, maybe to mesh this point cloud, but this is a difficult problem. Okay, so basically here we have, uh, basically we have uh, for each uh, edge of this graph, right, we have uh, two vertices that are connected by an edge. So I have uh, my vertex i and its neighbors that I denote by j. So I can apply to it, we've seen this already before, yesterday, 
I can apply this age feature function, age that is parameterized by some set of parameters theta, so it's a small neural network that uh, inputs a pair of vertices and produces a feature per age, and then uh, this feature is aggregated, these features in the neighborhood are aggregated by some aggregation operator that is usually a sum or a maximum. Okay? And this is the age convolution, as we've seen before. So it's a local, learnable, nonlinear operator that takes this point cloud. You can obviously see that the uh, uh, the point that is a particular setting of it, right? Basically, it uh, treats points individually. Here we treat, we treat pairs of points, right? And you can see that, for example, Laplacian-based uh, neural networks uh, are also a particular case, right? So you can just use this kind of fixed, non-learnable uh, edge uh, feature function, right? Uh, using the graph Laplacian, for example, and the aggregation is a sum, right? Point net is, uh, you, it doesn't use pairs of points, it uses uh, just individual points, right? And uh, uh, for example, the Monet architecture also uses some special uh, age feature function. So you can, you can see them as uh, particular settings of, of this framework. Another thing here is that the graph is not given. So if yesterday we talked about scenarios where somebody gives you the graph, right? Let's say a social network and you basically you work on this graph. Here the graph is just an auxiliary construction. You start with a point cloud and then you construct the SK nearest neighbors. So nobody, nobody tells you that you need to keep it throughout the neural network. You can actually update it at every layer or maybe from time to time, right? So you can update this graph uh, throughout the neural network. And uh, here is the reason why it might help. So if your input uh, is a point cloud, Right? And let's say that your signal, the, 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 the supervision signal is uh, this segmentation. So I want to segment the air, airplane into body, wings, engines, and so on and so forth. Right? So uh, initially, uh, the, the graph represents uh, essentially the Euclidean metric. Right? So basically, my neighbors will be nearby points in the Euclidean sense. Right? So it's hard for me to visualize the distance between high dimensional features. I visualize it with this uh, uh, distance field from the red point. Right, so I show by yellow uh, uh, color shows uh, close points and blue colors show uh, distant points. Right, so you see that the initially it's a Euclidean ball essentially, but as I go deeper into the neural network, you see that it becomes less and less geometric and more and more semantic. So you see that after the third layer, for example, the uh, distance from a point on the uh, on the engine uh, is actually uh, the neural network uh, finds that another engine is closer than let's say the wing or the body. And uh, this is possible by updating the graph throughout the, the, the neural network to capture correctly uh, this structure. And if you look at the results, well, some standard benchmarks for, for example, for shape classification, model S40, that is popular, uh, that is popular in this community. Uh, at some point of time, uh, these were state-of-the-art results, probably not anymore. Uh, well, the one thing about deep learning that state-of-the-art results uh, become obsolete very quickly sometimes in a matter of just a few weeks. So probably it's not state-of-the-art anymore. Uh, here is another example from uh, semantic segmentation. So you see that uh, each uh, point is labeled uh, based on the, let's say, the, the, uh, the, the class of uh, structure that it represents. And here are some examples of uh, point clouds that come from real scans, indoor environments. And here the point clouds, the cloud is six-dimensional, so it has uh, 3D coordinates plus uh, RGB uh, texture. Okay, and here as well, uh, this neural network works better. The complexity is more or less similar to, to point net. It is slightly more expensive to compute, but the number of parameters is slightly the same. But the results are better, so it, it makes sense to incorporate structure in the form of uh, in the form of the graph. Okay, and here are some other examples: prediction of uh, the surface normals. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think I'm out of time, so let me summarize. Uh, basically, we've, we started with this uh, construction where we wanted to, to get a deformation invariance. So it doesn't actually need to be deformation uh, invariance, uh, also uh, viewpoint invariance, right? Basically, volumetric representations are not invariant even to rotations of the, of the object. So basically, treating uh, your shapes as meshes or manifolds or point clouds or graphs, you, uh, you get this uh, invariance uh, automatically by construction. 
this allows to uh, 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 the neural networks have vastly less parameters and train on much less data. So to give you uh, an order of magnitude, to give you a ballpark about how much less data, the correspondence example that I showed were trained on something like 100 shapes. So just 100 shapes. Usually in, in deep learning uh, literature, you're talking about data sets that contain millions of examples. So that's uh, the power of incorporating uh, deformation invariance into the model. Uh, so this is obviously part of a bigger trend of genetic deep learning or deep learning on non-Euclidean domains, what you've seen yesterday uh, on graphs. So you can think of many folds as a particular example of graphs, which have actually more structure because they are locally Euclidean, graphs usually are not. Uh, there are several ways of defining uh, uh, convolutional neural networks on, on manifolds. So you can do it in the spectral domain, you can do it in the spatial, the spatial domain. And uh, interesting problems regard uh, shape synthesis. Uh, especially challenging is synthesis that synthesizes also the mesh, not only the positions. So basically you want to synthesize shapes with different topology, with different connectivity. Okay, and this is also similar to the problem of uh, generating, uh, generating graphs. So just to compare the intrinsic methods or point clouds, the cloud-based methods to the more traditional volumetric architectures, you can see obviously there are advantages and disadvantages, right? Uh, basically for volumetric representations, for example, you can use more or less standard uh, deep learning techniques, maybe with three-dimensional filters. For surface-based uh, uh, representations, uh, your data is unstructured, you need some exotic convolutional uh, operations, but in many cases it's worthwhile if you, for example, need to deal with deformations, if you, if you need less data to train the neural network, and uh, you want uh, the model to be automatically invariant uh, to, to deformations. So basically, this is a built-in property. So I think I will stop here. Thank you very much.